Uh, welcome. So I want to talk about an undergraduate module in which we embedded a cultural sensitivity uh, framework. This project is part of an ongoing research collaboration between myself and my colleagues Yushra Siddiqui and Caroline Ball. So to start, I want to provide you with what inspired this particular intervention. Um, and it builds on the work of Kathleen Clint Quinlan and Dave Thomas. So Kathleen and, and Dave um, have done a lot of work around culturally sensitive curriculum. So I, I guess a good place to start is what do I mean by that at least? Um, so a culturally sensitive curriculum is one in which the the attitudes, the pedagogy, so your teaching methods and practice, and the teaching materials and theorials themselves are related to students' cultural characteristics, their experiences, and their context. So it contains positive references, it um, respects all people, it legitimises knowledge from all communities and cultures, and it reinforces feelings of self-efficacy and interest. It gives them a sense of agency in the curriculum. Um, so that's what I mean by culturally sensitive curriculum. Um, they've got three kind of key uh, outputs that I've used as part of developing this framework to apply the module well. The last of those, the third one down on the list, was particularly interesting and inspiring to me. So in it, they took um, an ethnically diverse sample of 262 people, uh, people, sorry, students, and asked them to rate the cultural sensitivity of the curriculum in whatever their, you know, major subject was. And they also asked them to rank their interest as well. So of those students, the ethnic minority students, which were 157 people in the sample, they perceived their curriculum as less culturally sensitive on all four dimensions of the cultural cultural sensitivity scale that Thomas and Quinlan designed. And I, I should talk about that in a minute. Uh, and had a lower levels of interest in their curriculum than the white students, which were 100 people in the sample. So each of the kind of dimensions of Thomas and Quinlan's cultural sensitivity scale was related to interest. But what was really interesting in this paper is that regression analysis showed that two dimensions of the cultural sensitivity, so in this case it was diversity represented and challenging power, um, mediated the effects of ethnicity on interest. So what this means, or my interpretation of what it means, is that if you ensure that your curriculum is diverse, and critical, it may some more may support ethnic minority students' interest. Uh, you know, interest could be linked to engagement, and which could then for potentially contribute to some uh, reducing the you know achievement or awarding gaps at institutions. Recognizing that you know curricula is only one part of the systemic issues related to those achievement stroke awarding gaps. So that was the inspiration for the work. Um, so I mentioned the scale a few times. So what is the scale? So, I mean, obviously read it for yourself um, in the original work. These are my just in interpretations <coughs> of it. But there are four kind of, uh, uh, you know, pillars to it. First one is diversity of, is present. So this focus focuses on how people from diverse backgrounds are referenced within the curriculum themselves. So how are people of diverse ethnicities represented so i guess like the classic is making sure they're shown as researchers and not just uh, or, or professionals and not just participants in research or consumers of research um, um making sure that the you know curriculum references different ethnic and cultural traditions or languages or even clothing you know whatever um three uh, the the curriculum respects that different cultures have different understandings and different skills and different philosophies underpin them. And in the example I'm going to give you in a minute from our module, that's particularly relevant there. Next one is positive portrayals. So this focuses on 
readdressing any assumptions or perceptions, you know, linked to people from uh, different backgrounds, uh, which may distort how they're viewed by society. So the classic example that people talk about here would be, you know, when social problems like crime and violence are presented, people of, you know, colour often considered the problem or, you know, feature in that narrative. Um, or the other well talked about example is when people of colour have problems, white people are usually presented as being able to solve those problems. So white saviour complex. The third one is challenging power. So a focus on the sort of curriculum's ability to provoke critical thought and challenge dominant ideologies. So use the curriculum to raise these questions about power and privilege, things that I have certainly taken for granted before, but, you know, um, you know, embed those into your curriculum story. Encourage rather than discourage <laughs> students to connect to learn, you know, wider learning, the social, political and environmental concerns they may have or the environment outside and link those into your curriculum. And even perhaps take encourage students to take actions that fight inequity or pro promote equity you know, as part of your authentic real world learning and narrative. Uh, and then finally, you know, inclusive classroom interactions. So this focuses very much on the learning environment itself as being accepting, uh, accepting of co different cultural and um, different cultural perspective and other perspectives. So, you know, this is down to very small things like making an absolute effort to, you know, pronounce everyone's name correctly, which I'm sure we all do. Um, making sure that, sh you know, students respect other students perspectives and we create a classroom environment where those perspectives can be shared if they wish to be so they're the four pillars of the culturally sensitive curriculum so what did we do so we took a module and i'll give you the kind of background to the module as part of the results but essentially i took those four pillars and used them as i guess a reflective lens um on a module uh, so how did i break down a module so in this first version i broke it down into these kind of uh, categories which you can see on the slide in the orange box at the top uh, so three are kind of synchronous aspects so one is the slides and materials so basically anything that i put in front of a student the second is the narrative so not just what actually i say but the kind of the intent of the session I mean, I don't write a script. I'm sure not many of us do, but you do plan approximately, roughly, how you're going to drive the narrative of a session. Um, third was the actual activities, including the structure of those, as well as the substance. And the last one was asynchronous tasks. Um, and then I broke down, as you can see on the left, where the number one is each of my kind of lectures into like the main sort of components, so, you know, the subheadings of my lecture effectively, and considered the four pillars with that in that context. So, and, and there are made changes. Um, so you probably won't, you won't be able to read it in the top right, but you can see by just the squiggles that there was quite a lot of changes I made. And I was quite surprised at the number of changes that I made, you know, as someone who's been educating for quite a, quite a while. And I thought, you know, I was um, being fairly inclusive in my teaching practice. Now, many of these examples were really, really small. You know, um, you know, for example, you know, when I was presenting a particular survey, just making sure I explicitly talk about the demographics you know, of that survey to see if it represented, in this case, the British public. Um, um, there was a couple of authors whose work I talked about. I didn't know anything about them. So I just done a little search just to understand who they are, where they came from, their background. And of course, to check you know any other views that they may have, which are important to share with the group. But there were also some, you know, some bigger ones, the bigger changes that I made here, here, um, you know, in terms of use of cultural specific um, examples like TV clips and examples. Um, and the coursework, um, um, for example, um, there's one piece of coursework is a portfolio more about that afterwards, where students in the class talk about a fictional town called Hammington. 
and they have to come up with a communication strategy for this fictional town for which i include some demographic information we start it in class and then students you know continue that activity at home and write it up as part of this exercise we i still did hammington still did the same exercise uh, asked a few more challenging questions you know about to take it away from hammington but in the coursework i gave the option of using any town in the world all they had to do was give me a wikipedia link to that town so i could you know understand the demographic makeup of that town and several students did that they you know chose towns from over the world with you know they either maybe they visited maybe they they've got a personal link to um maybe they're just interested in the cultural background of that particular town um, some still stuck with the original hammington but others chose to ex bring in uh, personal experiences so I made those changes. So that in its own for me was a really powerful experience. I learned a lot from it. Um, uh, and you know, I consider that very much phase one of using this kind of tool. So how do we study it? So the module was called Science Communication, 68 students um, uh, uh, of uh, uh, who study biology, human biology, biomedical science, etc. Um, and the research study we decided to do is focused around the key module question, which is what is science communication? So I ask it right at the beginning and then I ask it at the very end of the module. And we analysed um, sort of a pre and post module kind of activity around post-it notes as an individual, then joining those together and putting them on flip charts uh, and then consolidating the kind of ideas that come about. Uh, and then the second part, the more substantive part, was some coursework analysis. So we used a top down deductive approach, looking at the students coursework. In essence, what we're looking for, was there any influence or any evidence from their coursework of, you know, cultural awareness in the things that they chose to write? It's important here to just tell you what the coursework is. So. There's two pieces of coursework, but the substantive one is a portfolio. So each week, um, the, the class undertake an activity in class, and then that goes on to form a portfolio piece. Now, I recognise that students have different preferences, enjoy different parts of the module. So they only actually have to write up two portfolio pieces from the choice of nine that are given. They do them all in the class. Um, but I need to write up. So that means there's quite a lot of variety in the pieces that students choose. But I really want them to enjoy the pieces, feel a bit of passion for the piece they choose to write up. And as in the example of Hamilton explained, each of those pieces also includes a lot of, you know, local level choice, you know, to give them some even more variation and apply it to them. So how did we analyse the coursework? So we already mentioned the top down deductive approach. So let's look at the early results uh, and on what we're going to do next. So, first of all, the three principal researchers uh, came up independently with a list of keywords, um, which uh, we thought represented the broader may represent broader cultural awareness in the student work. Um, and what you can see this list here on the left. There are some words excluded. I'll explain why in a minute. And then for each of the words that we came up with independently, I ran them through a small section of the students coursework. And then I ranked the number of hits that you can see here. Then anything that was greater than four, I took through to the second wave. So ones with lower than four hits were removed from the list. The exception being racially because it was so similar to race and should say in the second wave, you know, we, we did adapt the wording to make sure, you know, things like, you know, you got cultural and cultural, but made sure culturally was included as well, as well, diverse, diversely, et cetera, to make sure we didn't miss any hits. Then in the second wave, search the full portfolio of the student coursework or well, 56 of the student submissions we've, we've viewed. So this is a very lengthy uh, document that was searched for. And then for each of those hits at this stage, we may I made a um, 
look at each hair and saw how many of those were in context. So how many of the words that in the second wave hit, created a hit so that they matched actually appeared to be on top level um, looking linked to culture. So, for example, you can see in race, there were seven of the 22 hits which were talking about race in a cultural sense. The other ones you can see from the other uses list related to other things, you know, like embrace or space race. So um, several of the terms that we came up with had lots of context driven hits, um, e.g., you know, background, uh, you know, you know, black, uh, white. Others had almost none. So, you know, um, for example, um, uh, sorry, for example, some of the ones around like um, uh, colour, for example. So, so the module science communication, there's a lot of talk about colour as a um, mechanism for delivering effective science communication and things like museums and, and those kind of things, uh, explaining colour choices. So none of them actually linked to cultural sense things. So then the next step after these is we drew out each of the quotes, which are context delivered. We you know we have all those. And now we're beginning our kind of analysis of these particular quotes and looking for ideas and themes. So we're doing a little coding exercise. Uh, and we've come up with at this preliminary stage four codes four things we can see in the student coursework um, so let's just talk through them so the first one is directly challenging aspects of the module content um, so a good example of this is that you know the module is about science communication so if we're talking about a named science communication pioneer we saw evidence of students highlighting aspects such as the pioneer's gender or the pioneer's race, often in the context of privilege that they may be given or, or in the contra disadvantage they may have had um, uh, and then benchmarking their, you know, work body of work and their relative successes against that. So we saw some direct challenge. The second thing that we saw was incorporating their own cultural experiences. Um, so I've already given the example of Hamilton in the coursework. There's another coursework element, which is, you know, on sort of global science communication. And in the session, we focused on the gl global responses to the COVID-19 pandemic and how scientists were used as part of the political narrative to get behavioural change, uh, etc. And in this lots of students showcase examples and ideas that were drawn from their own personal experiences or backgrounds and their and connections. The third thing was acknowledgement of cultural diversity. Um, th this one was quite common. So this module is very focused on the term the general public, you know, as recipients of science communication. And, you know, a lot of students talked about the general public as being a non non homogeneous group, and considering different viewpoints when talking about the general public. Uh, and the last one is, as it said, you know, general aware awareness of barriers or systematic challenges. You know, e.g., um, um, it's well reported, and several students pointed out the you know the barriers in you know particularly um, people from a black background accessing things like museums. So they're the four initial findings of this study. I uh, hope you found this talk interesting.